Okay, so we will uh, try with this last lecture to try to round it up a bit and see um, what uh, what is the process that you need to go through to develop your building BIM execution plan and uh, <coughs> to what benefits and what are some of the technologies that are important when it comes to information technology standards to adopt. So. Uh, I have a lot of slides in this presentation, but um, I will go through them rather quickly, I suppose. Uh, some of them are just a recap. So at the earth of building information modeling, there are three key, be key benefits that we wish to achieve. And uh, the major one is probably the av availability for us through BIM to reuse information once it's captured. That's at the core. Uh, once you have it formalized in such a way that it's easy to reuse, then you can revise, correct, and control it fairly automatically in many, in many situations because you have semantics attached to them. It's not just uh, information, uh, it's not just data for you anymore, it's information. So it's something that has a meaning and there, as such can be compared with expected or reasonable value in, real, in the real world. <coughs> so you can check and validate it. What we have come to talk about just quickly this morning in the seminar is the importance of uh, availability of data at different points in time. <coughs> And we have found some value in identifying um, troubles in your, or, or problems or um, clashes of all sorts in our design before we go to construction. So in a way, this is a way, th this is, um, um, in a way this is equivalent of early collaboration. So bringing information <coughs> together as soon as possible is an important part of uh, execution planning. Um, what uh, scholars have identified in this situation is the need to move the information generation procedures from later to early in the, um, in the process. This, by the way, is one of the pictures that uh, you will find in the BIM bingo. I'm not sure whether you've ever seen that. Ten years, well, like a couple of months ago, um, Steve Hamill, which you have seen yesterday, uh, produced the, that, that he, in his role as a BIM expert for the MBS attends hundreds of, of presentations on BIM every day uh, by all sorts of speakers, uh, have produced a list of the ten images that you must have in each um, in, in each building information modeling presentation, and this is uh, one of the ten. So I have the BIM bingo uh, for you. So when you attend the presentation, you can see what the slides are and go, oh, yeah, check, that's present, that's available, I want, and so on. So the idea that this conveys is that um, it is it, it, traditionally, it's always possible to, well, you need all the information at some point to compare. And, and, and build a project. Building information modeling is more successful if those considerations and those the, the production of that information happens earlier on during the pro project stage, because that allows you to produce and to produce more analytical reports and be more um, be, be more accurate in the. Um, in understanding potential conflicts and, and uh, identifying problems. So this, the point is that we are trying to move from traditional to BIM enabled the production of information earlier in the process. And this has a, uh, this has a cost implication. <coughs> so it's important that to get this cost implication, to, to be able to support this cost implication, you have some cost benefits that are clearly identified. 
One of the problems that uh, BIM still have is <coughs> connected to interoperability. We have touched briefly about, uh, upon this in the past few days. The problem is clear. Different data formats or different applications not necessarily uh, are capable of talking to each other. <coughs> On day one, we have covered extensively the idea of what information is, uh, is, is and how it is encoded in data. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> I have a sore throat today. Um, so interoperability is the technical availability for you of tools to migrate information from a software to another and use it to its full potential. Um, the technical solution for this, the most reliable this far technical solution for this, um, either stands in the adoption of uh, software that have been developed with interoperability in mind, so uh, let's say using only software from a single brand to develop all of your uh, project, or um, rely on formats that can transfer information without losing data. Building Smart is uh, an initiative, in its, uh, in its, uh, it's an international alliance of people that have uh, uh, spent time defining a format that is rich in terms of semantic and that allows you to encapsulate building information, modeling information and uh, transfer it across other applications. So there are software uh, that are IFC enabled. This software can read and write IFC format, <coughs> which is a standard that Building Smart produced, and it's now an international I, um, standard that is defined by the ISO. If you want to know more about the, and you, we, we have seen uh, how an IFC file looks yesterday. Steve opened it um, in, in Notepad. What I want to do th now is to point you to the, um, the resource uh, that um, uh, specifies IFC. The reason I'm pointing you here is because it's important to understand that IFC is a file format, but it's not self-standing as it is. It is part of a suite of standards that help you not only define data, but also define processes for data exchange and uh, terms that you use inside the, that data. So in a sense, you have an important, um, uh, it, you have to keep in mind that uh, data in its own right is not enough. You have to make sure that libraries are shared, and this is uh, the terms that you can find in ISO 2006, uh, 12, 12, uh, uh, and processes. So what are you going to do with those data in those libraries? You can uh, browse freely within these websites uh, that to, to get information on, on the, um, how data is archived in IFC. The, the standard in its own right is divided in different groups of information. You have the kernel information that is shared between all the, uh, all the properties. You have product extensions, control extensions, and process extensions. So product extensions are all the classes within the code, within the, uh, the format that deal with information about building components. Uh, process extensions are all the classes that deal with the activities that you can run onto the components. So building IFCs are not just about the three-dimensional aspect of a building, they, are, they can include all sorts of semantic mm, values for all aspects of the whole procurement process. If you look at the 
um, and then there are extensions of all sorts uh, that you can you can look at electrical domain plumbing domain architectural domains structural domains and so on so there will be areas of interest that are that extend on the core um, info core data sets that are available to IFC if you look at uh, the entities so each of these uh, groups is composed of a number of entities and um, there are plenty of them so if I just select the entities there are 764 of them so there are like it's just like saying that there are 764 different types of objects that IFC can deal with. Um, so an air terminal, for instance, is one of those elements. An air terminal is one of the MEP components of a building. If you go and open this, it will tell you what are the properties that you can specify about it. Um, the history, the terminal type connection, the sound generation of it, the electrical device common and so on. So these are all fields, informations that you can specify on the speci on every individual air terminal in your building. Um, some of, I mean, s most of these things have been thought through and there are, so these are probably the fields that you would expect to find. If there are any fields that you cannot find in the current standard, IFC also provides with ways to add metadata to the schema. So you can add information that wouldn't normally have um, an agreed um, template by saying, okay, I need one more information about this thing. I will call it the air of the temperature in the morning at 7 o'clock and you can add it through a mechanism that um, you can access to retrieve that information but maybe not everybody else in the construction industry shares that uh, sorry again in a lecture uh, I generally don't use my laptop for a presentation but in this case I have a custom software that I want to show um, and this is Serafim Malvanides, our colleague here at Northumbria University. He's a geographer. So, you know that there are core features and then you can extend on them if perhaps you can't find all the data, all the fields or the kind of cells where you want to save your information. Okay. Um, so, IFC we have seen includes is, is a relational te format a relational format is something whereby you can not only save information about a specific object but also say that you know state clearly that some object is somehow connected to some other object so there is that door and there is that wall and there is a connection between them they have two different tables where you can save the information and then there is uh, there is a possibility for you to say okay this door needs an opening inside this wall and this door is part of this uh, space and this door is connected to well needs to be three centimeters above that uh, floor and so on so all of this relationship between elements can also be classified you can browse some examples here to have an idea of uh, uh, how IFC looks like if you want so you can go and see okay there is an IFC project and the ti its title is example project uh, you can define what are the units of measure that are adopted in this um, in this uh, file um, where, with regards to length areas volumes times and so on okay sometimes there are fixed values that you can put in and sometimes there are open uh, values. So sometimes the values are restricted to a specific range and sometimes they are uh, for the user to specify. You had a question, Kieran? Yeah. Uh, you said uh, programming language. What language is that? This is not a programming language. This is a 
file format for transferring information. So you cannot produce an algorithm. But it's open, is it open source? Or? It is publicly available. So it, it is an open format. So you can, if you want, go and see what are the specifications and you can go and s understand what this one means. Hmm? So you can, it, it's the whatever 15th number in that line and the 15th number, number on the type of IFC door is always is thickness, say. Okay, so you can say, you can see um, what all of these values mean because the format is publicly available so everybody can understand it. But it's not a programming language because you cannot write a software you cannot write an algorithm through it. You can just save data. Okay, you can just specify information. Like did you become this experiment? Professor? Yes. Yeah. I'll be. I'll, there, there is a slide on experiment later on today. That's what I was getting from this. So these are different ways of encoding information. Okay. I'll. Uh, go back to the presentation but what I wanted to highlight from this is that there are 760 something different types of information so there is something called IFC dimensional exponents IFC measure with unit so all of these things are things that you can say about a building so for a door you will say there is an IFC door that will attach will be attached to an IFC door style because you can create libraries inside it and so on. So it's there are 764 types. It's not an easy file format to write or read. It's very elaborated. Okay. For each information, you need to know what is the best f f um, f table to open and go and say, okay, this is not really an an, an SI unit of measure, it's a WKG unit of measure or whatever. Mm, complicated. So, let's go back to our presentation and see what's next. And the next thing is Kobe. It's called Bim Bingo. It, I think it is, yes. Yeah, um, so this is the Bim Bingo kind of presentation I'm having today. Uh, Kobe is another standard that makes, or well, better yet, tries to make building information modeling uh, data more immediate for the user. So it's fairly complicated to read an IFC file, and on the other hand, it's extremely simple to read a Kobe file. Now, the level of precision, the level of information that you have in the two formats is much different. Kobe is generally defined as a standard that is not of interest of everybody, but is a, as a particular focus for the client. It's a particular interest for the client to help him specify the strategic value of a building. Okay, <coughs> and it, it is it aims at covering areas of uh, of operation of a building that goes from design to build to operate so it, it's not limited to the design it extends into the operational life of a building from inception to operation um, a Kobe file looks like a spreadsheet okay the, the the format of a Kobe file is a spreadsheet so for each building, you have a number of different sheets that contain uh, different types of information, and in each of them you have a row for each of the interesting items in that class. What are the, these classes? So what are these uh, information that are included into Kobe? Well, they are the ones that you see here are information about the facilities so or about the whole building some information about the number of stories so you have a line for each of the stories you have information about the spaces in each of the stories you have information about the zones in each of the spaces so it's basically 
At this stage, COVID is just a big classification of the spaces available to the user through a topological tree, okay? To topology is the, the science of dividing spaces into subspaces. So you have a whole building, a story, uh, a room, and then a space. Um, and this is information that should be available from early design. When you're starting to design a building, you already know what is, what is the target of, of number of, of rooms that you want to have, or, or the overall square size of, of a building, floor size of a building. On top of that, you can start adding information that is useful for the maintenance of this or, or, or for the development of this building, which can include contacts. So who is working on it? And uh, what are the documents that we have about this building? So what files did we receive about it? Um, and there are other areas. These are a few areas, a few areas of information that you can start com filling in from the early on, from the very early stages. So these are early design stage information. As the, the work goes on and we have more information about the building, then you can start defining what are the components that produce, that create this building. So how, what is its design? What does it look like? But all of this is non-vector -ve based. So all of this is alphanumeric. You don't have uh, the shape of a component. You know that there is such a component. That you know that there is a door. You know that there is a window. You know that there is something. You have some properties about it. But you don't know uh, what model is it, maybe. Or if you know that, you don't know how it looks like. There is no 3D geometry in Kobe. Okay. And components uh, make up systems and are made of a given type and so on. So you increase the amount of information as design progresses uh, through adding more um, pages to your Excel file. Okay? <coughs> and during the build, you then extend some of this information. At subs and whenever I say that you extend, what I mean is that you can uh, add a so-called data drop. So you uh, have you heard with uh, of data drops with uh, David previously, maybe? It was just mentioned in the revamp plan. Exactly, the exactly. Because um, I, uh, that's exactly why it came, it came to mind. Because uh, in the RIBA beam overlay, there are a number of stages where a data drop is expected. A data drop is a moment where you exchange or, or um, where, where you kind of um, freeze the, si the, the situation of the design at that point. So uh, at subsequent data drops you would add more information to the Kobe format. Um, so the type is not enough at, at build level, it will include information about the warranty associated with that element and so on, uh, or a component, and what happened during the installation of that element or, or a component and so on. So, COBE is a standard that is broadly, broadly used and required in the UK at the moment. During the final stages of a build, then you can add even more information. Do we have any spare element available for that type? Where is it stored? Um, how can I get more if, I, if, if something is required during operation of the building? Um, what type of job do I need to replace that element? Uh, what job did I ever run or execute on that element? So I can have the whole history of all the activities that I have been doing or to maintain my windows in the past 20 years, Archi continuously archiving them in the same Kobe file. <coughs> okay, so we have seen how um, how Kobe is one of the possible standards for exchanging information in an easily understandable format about a building and we've seen about what IFC is and it's the same thing but at a higher level of complexity and uh, I want now to show you an example of uh, um, want you to show you an example of uh, 
and I hope it works. Yes. Of uh, a software tool that takes advantage of this. This is uh, the four project extranet. Uh, you have been presented with uh, extranets in the first lecture, and then um, Peter Barker pointed you at a list of characteristics of different types of extranets uh, when uh, presenting alternative options to clients for in the definition of a BIM execution plan. An extranet is an infrastructure that you adopt to exchange information between all the players in, um, on, on the internet, between different stakeholders in a, in a project. Now this one is the one, the, the version of an extranet that four projects have built. Four projects uh, well, sell to you the service of dealing with uh, of, of, uh, of dealing with your data. They guarantee that your data is securely stored, they guarantee that you will have access to it with some sort of reliability, they allow you methods to exchange contact information between all the different parties in a project, uh, implement workflows and so on. There are plenty of things that they do, I don't really have time now to cover all of that but um, subsequent lectures will cover these aspects in the course of the semester. For the time being, I only wanted to show you that um, how interoperability has been used by four projects to, um, to extend the features that they traditionally adopt ahead in the system uh, so what they do is basically give you a basic tree structure where you can archive all your files and, and, and emails and forums and discussion on a specific project. In this case you, you have a folder where a lot of files uh, sit, but if you go, um, and I hope it works, it should, if you go on um, say the library here, and you, what I notice is that's an IFC file, so it's it's been exported by Revit. So we did have a model of uh, the campus um, in Revit. We have exported it in IFC, uploaded it to the um, to the um, extranet, and the extranet on its own gives us the ability to view the three-dimensional di model of that IFC file inside your browser. So you can navigate this three-dimensional object um, even if you don't have any software application, you don't have Revit, you don't have uh, anything else but your web browser. And you can go and query it uh, in a number of ways by component or, or by container. If you look at containment then um, you can go and let's say hide all of it and then only show the sixth floor and uh, zoom to it and pan and so on. So you can investigate issues, you could probably attach um, information to it, you can attach properties to it, you can exchange messages about an element and so on and this will be visible inside the extranet and this can be exported again back to IFC so that the comments that you put here on uh, an extranet website can be then embedded into the Revit files, can be brought back through IFC into Revit. So, <coughs> this is pretty powerful and it's something that is only been available for, uh, for the past few months uh, in the industry. By the way, there is here a mechanism that exports COBE from the IFC. So IFC, as we said, it's a very rich format. It can contain all the information. So it's possible to go and open an IFC file and try to export the subset of it that COBE <coughs> requires. So um, you have uh, the concept of a person in IFC, a collaborator and you can attach activities to them and so on and Kobe also have that idea so you can go and upload an IFC file and transform it into Kobe 
and you can view that there is a list of people with their email addresses and their, the company they work for and so on and so forth and you see they have contacts, you have information about the facility um, and uh, you have information about f floors so each floor comes with uh, uh, information on who created it, what is the system it was initially designed in um, what is uh, what is the element that defines it inside the AFC file what's its description what what is its elevation, so what is its height, uh, and so on. And same again for the spaces, for the components, and so on. So you see you can, you can uh, extract one format from another. But this is not magic. The way you extract one component from another, one, one format from another, is in this case is by writing a custom application for it so these people at four projects have been uh, working um, on, a, on a software that goes and reads through a, a C identifies the classes that make sense for Kobe that are that have some information that is connected to Kobe and produce an output of an Excel like file or an Excel like format on the basis of information found there Of course, they could start from scratch and developing a software that would do that from scratch. But the another option that they had and the option that they have chosen is to work with us um, using a toolkit that we have developed in the past couple of years. And this is called XBIM. So XBIM is a software toolkit that Northumbria University has produced that is open source, that is available for free use for everybody, that simplifies y your ability to write a program that deals with IFC. So, if you want, if, if you want to open an IFC file, it looks something like this. You have hundreds and hundreds of lines of code like of information that looks like this. IXBIM is a toolkit that allows you to receive that same information of course because it cannot make up new information but it allows you to have access to that information in a much more structured way. You can ask the toolkit, can you please transform that IFC file uh, into a 3D model for me. So all those lines that tell you about ver uh, points and coordinates and stuff become visible to you. You can query how many items of type IFC doors are in it. How many different styles or door of doors are there in that file. Please select all the ones at layer 3, at a level 3, and change them to a different style. So you can either read the information or change the information and so on. So what the toolkit does is to provide you with high-level functionalities, simplifying your software to achieve interoperability through IFC. Uh, I think it's only fair to point out that there are competitors. Um, the, probably the, the, um, the most common competitor, uh, it's smaller because it's not as good as yeah, is that the one, is it? Uh, this is BIM server, it's a TNO uh, based development now our um, software is a .NET software based, so it's, a, it's, a, it's based on Microsoft languages uh, whereas BIM server is based on Java Java being a different platform for software development. So if you want to write a new software that works with uh, C Sharp, which is a programming language, uh, you will select XBIM. If you want to write a project in, uh, if you want to write a software using Java, you will probably have to use BIM Server. There are some compatibility issues. So these are toolkits that simplify your life when you are to write custom processing application for your data. 
one way in which we used it in the past that was kind of quickly covered, uh, well, shown in some of the pictures uh, of the of the um, uh, building Qatar Life uh, is that, for instance, one of the things we've done is to is extract ma information from the material from the materials that are in a building information model of a building, and uh, in connect them with information about carbon emissions connected with those materials, and and produce uh, a report on what is the carbon cost of a building, just by merging information from one source and another one, and then bringing it bringing it together. But you can think of any number of activities that you want to, to run on once you have access to the data. Just to quickly try and complete an overview about the environment that we are working in, uh, we mentioned a number of times classification and codes and so it's important uh, for you to know that UNICLASS is uh, one of the most common classification methods used lately and it's now available online for open access so you can go to that URL there beamgateway.co.uk and you can um, have access to an interactive um, version of uh, UNICLASS so <coughs> you can kind of view uh, what it's made so the class A11 means it's connected to dictionaries and, and so on there are a number of entries case well so A26 it's patents license and copyrights if you ever have to classify things like that uh, I think it's important to move to oh no terrible um, so architecture by name of the architect this is one way to classify elements and so on so you can, you, you can do this online. Another important bit uh, is that um, it comes with APIs available. So you can actually think of including the API dictionary in your application by querying the service that will tell you what the classification should be for different elements or will help you find the right classification for an element that you want to classify. Also, Uniclass 2 is about to come and there are links available uh, here for you to access the proposed, the new proposed uh, classification structure for Uniclass. <coughs> I think we are running out of time. We are now at the moment where I should leave, let you ask questions. But um, I think there are a couple of things I want to cover before. And one would be an observation of what are current IT trends. And current IT trends are going towards what you have surely heard about, and it's the cloud. You, have you heard of the cloud or, or cloud computing, I suppose? So the idea is that you will have a number of servers that are distributed over the network that you can have access to remotely, and they will uh, provide to you access to your information or to your data or to the services that they, that they provide, the calculation or computation services, uh, through APIs that are platform independent. So you will probably have access to them both from your mobile phones or your PC or your tablet or whatever it is, but probably with different user interfaces in all different scenarios. Um, this is supposedly there to increase the flexibility, integration, reusability and scalability of all these. Uh, so if you can think of clever way to um, atomize, so create atomic elements, atomic services that make sense, you will be able to reuse them in a number of occasions in the future. I think from a, from a social perspective there is also an interesting trend going on online and that is to try and make use of globalization uh, and uh, um, reachability of everybody on the network through uh, exploiting uh, uh, the, the distributed nature of, of, of the network in providing new ideas. So you could actually think of services whereby you put up on some website the initial 
sketches of uh, I'll move to that the the you, you could actually crowdsource something so you put on some server online the initial sketches of a drawing and then you say okay this is my initial idea and you put some prizes up for people to um, compete in order to come back to you with clever solutions on how you want to maybe to uh, detail the facade of a building or what is a better way structure or a cheaper way to produce a structure that will would stand up to the requirements of your building and so on so it was a really another quick um, kind of show about the technologies available uh, to you to think beyond what is feasible today uh, in your building execution plans to achieve atomic interoperable processes that will be probably reused again and again between uh, between the different parties of the complex supply chain of the construction industry and I think from now on I will publish some more of more slides but um, the next slides on this PowerPoint are all about uh, some of the benefits that you can hope to achieve from uh, from um, building information modeling and its adoption um, and uh, I'll let you just google the terms in your own time okay thank you very much the course ends here